Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we are going to give it just a few additional moments here uh, to let folks uh, join the call and get set up on audio and video, and then we will proceed from there. All right, and with that, I think we're looking pretty good. Um, again, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, I would like to welcome you to the NSBA Veterans Network's uh, next installment of the uh, Service to Success series, uh, in which we will be taking on um, a variety of, of issues. Oops, I apologize. Give us just, just one moment here. There we go. Um, apologies for the brief technical difficulty there. Um, as I was mentioning during this series, we'll be taking on uh, the issues that are disproportionately impacting veterans and small business. Um, we have a great program for you today uh, in which we will get into the nuts and bolts of the federal procurement process, uh, some best practices and pain points and, and how to navigate uh, those, those challenges. Uh, now, before we begin, I'd like to cover a few ground rules with, with everyone here. Uh, first, we would respectfully ask that you keep yourself on mute uh, during our discussion uh, for the um, clarity and, and for the accessibility of your uh, fellow members on the call today. Uh, secondly, we will be taking questions throughout uh, the conversation today. Um, so if you have a question or a comment or an insight that you would like to contribute to the discussion, uh, there are a few ways that you can do so. Uh, the first and perhaps the most effective way to do so will be to uh, throw your question in the meeting group chat. Uh, that is a chat that we will be monitoring um, throughout the presentation and we will be able to respond to questions in the order in which they're received there. Um, there are a couple of other ways to do it though, especially during our Q and A uh, portion of our time today. Uh, you can either raise a hand with the reactions feature of Zoom down on your bottom menu bar, or you can just throw up uh, a good old fashioned hand just like this and, and take yourself off mute um, in, in, a, in a natural fashion during, during the conversation. Um, now, if you have any questions, uh, of course, our, our staff is available and we will look forward to following up with you after the event. All right, with that, I will kick it over to uh, one of our two moderators, Joni Myers, uh, for uh, the real introduction. Joni. Hello, welcome everyone. Um, we are coast to coast across the country today and um, I wanna give you a big uh, National Small Business Association welcome. I am very privileged and honored to be a trustee of NSBA and uh, can truly say in all my years in business, it's been the most uh, return on investment organization that I have been a part of in an amazing group of people. And um, to really kick off our program this year, we started to do a special focus on veteran owned businesses. In my case, I um, own a small business and um, I'm a co-founder of another small business and I work in the national security space. Very privileged to support the special operations and uh, the IC communities. And as much as I work in national security, I believe that economic security is the small business component in the United States. We are the heartbeat really of the economy. And so these types of programs we feel are critical and um, we're looking at constant improvement. So we really appreciate your time with us today and any of the comments we will keep in also maybe address after if we can't get it in the program today. So I'm uh, very pleased to introduce to you Shauna Weatherly who is a 35 year plus veteran on the contracting side, working in different roles in the government, and now is the founder and CEO of Federal Subcontract Solutions. Uh, an additional panelist is Keith King, who is the executive director of NVBDC, 
which is the National Veterans Business Development Council. And then I'm very pleased joining us is Bill Belkamp, my fellow trustee for NSBA, and also um, a, uh, a service veteran, a um, distinguished member of, um, well, graduate of West Point, and um, I believe it still leads the West Point Society in Philadelphia, but um, most accurately is president and CEO of Ornig LLC, which is a government contractor and um, MEP uh, across the government. So I think what we have today is really a great panel to give you varying perspectives on some of the issues that uh, we're gonna start our conversation with, and then hopefully take your questions. And the easiest way with our large crowd will be if you could please put the question in the chat. Um, and just if we can manage that, I think will be quickest and uh, best. The um, other thing I want to note is if you scroll to the top of the chat is all of our panelists contact information is there. So please feel free if you'd like to one on one follow up with a panelist on something specific, or if you would like to follow up with our terrific uh, staff, our senior vice president Patrick Post and Ian Elzenbach, who is um, really the, the, the main mover in our whole uh, membership area and working the Veterans Network. So without further ado, um, I'd like for us to get started. Are you all ready? Here we go. Um, so folks, to our panel, I'd like to start by asking, with kind of taking it from a small business perspective, what is the best way to get a foot in the door with a federal agency? And how do I get my business seen by the buyers or the program personnel that are critical? So who would like to start? Keith, Shauna? Well, since you called my name, I guess I'll jump in on it. Um, Again, just as a point of background, I am a veteran. I am a Vietnam veteran. Um, I am actually the founder and CEO of the NDPDC. Now, I want to acknowledge uh, my partner, uh, Brigadier General Dick Miller, is on the call. He may not be speaking directly today, uh, but he's on the call as well. So I want to acknowledge him. The answer to your question, I really believe, even though my company, my personal company, was one of the very first to be designated and recognized by the federal government as a service disabled veteran of business uh, back a long time ago. Um, is one of the organizations inside the federal government. And I know Shona has worked in a lot of these various um, organizations, but the GSA for me was absolutely the cornerstone. Yes, I'm VA, I was VA uh, verified and service disabled, but really it was the GSA. And I highly recommend that anyone who's doing federal government go and pursue and see if you can get, even though it's a misnomer, it's not really a contract. They call it the GSA contract and get your foot in the door there. They open up a whole lot of other doors and I found them to be an exceptional support, uh, especially for veteran businesses at the time when we were first uh, becoming recognized and accepted by the federal government. And I'll turn it over to Shauna if you want, John, or whoever. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, from my perspective as a former contracting officer at DOD, FAA, and also the GSA that Keith mentions, um, I think there's a couple of real key areas to hit to get your foot in the door. And I think one of those is making sure that you create a business presence that's aimed at federal opportunities. So you have a couple ways to do that. You can do some research on your agencies, find out what they're spending, start being able to learn and talk their language, right? That shows that you have an interest and uh, you know about what they're, what they're wanting and needing. Um, you have other ways like the dynamic small business search profile. It's something that's created as part of the system for award management or SAM.gov registration process. 
And making that capabilities narrative in that DSBS very robust is important because federal buyers use that as one of their number one market research tools to find small businesses of all kinds. So very important to get that done. Um, one thing I think firms are afraid to do, but you should do is ask for a meet and greet, start building relationships with agency, small business specialists and program personnel that you've met maybe at a conference or what, uh, a, a webinar or get together. Um, and just ask for a 15 minute coffee break meeting. Agency personnel who are in these roles expect that and don't be shy about it. I mean, I, I used to do uh, those meetings all the time and it was a good way to get to know who was out there and available to do the work. And then responding to uh, agency requests for information and sources sought notices are very important. That's how the agencies know uh, they, they're doing their market research. They're asking who out there in industry is capable of doing their work and uh, responding, even if you can only do a portion of the work or provide a portion of the supplies is very important. Uh, that way they know if there's uh, ability to even set aside a portion of the work for businesses of your type and size. And then I think there's a couple of things just to really think about in terms of being agile. Think about whether or not you should be a prime or a sub. Uh, primes have a lot of responsibilities and small business primes have even more in terms of limits on what they can subcontract out depending on the products and services that they're offering. Um, but subcontractors can gain a lot of name recognition and valuable experience. So that's a, a good way to get your foot in the door with an agency. Um, and I do want to focus on one thing. Um, I used to work for the GSA Smart Pay program and manage the, the contracts that oversee the government's uh, purchase card program. And I would think, say, don't forget about small buys. The federal government spent almost $22 billion in FY21 using their purchase card. And that's a category of purchases called micro purchases that are $10,000 or less. You don't have to be registered in SAM.gov to get a micro purchase award, and there's no competition requirement. That means the agency can come directly to you to make a purchase. So that can be somebody you meet uh, at a webinar. You can say, hey, no task is too small for my business uh, because I take the purchase card. And those are some of the ways to get your foot in the door from my perspective uh, as a contracting officer, some good ways. Well, Bill, I want to kind of follow up on kind of on um, both the comments made so far. You have, um, I think, a wonderful background where you've worked in kind of the private sector, if you will, and then your company that 90% uh, or so works in the government space. Um, so you kind of have uh, a foot in each sector, if you will. What is different about doing, you know, business to business in the the private sector side versus business with the government sector? What should folks focus on? Sure, well, it all, it all depends on what, what uh, the value proposition that you have. Um, you know, what, what, so the value proposition is what uh, skill sets or, or what um, products or services do you have to offer the customer, number one, uh, that's competitive. And number two, what's your passion? What, what turns you on to wake up every morning to get out of bed and, and offer those uh, products or services uh, to, to your customer. As far as uh, you know, commercial and or, or, or federal, so I guess we'll start with federal. Um, I am a federal government contractor, been in business for 13 years, 190 uh, government contracts awarded since that time period. So lots of, lots of uh, uh, lessons learned because uh, I would say if, if you have a one in four win rate, so I've won one out of four on, on average, that means if I've won 190, you can imagine how many I've lost, how many lessons learned I, I have that I've applied uh, to the future. But with, with a federal government contracting, um, I would say two things. One is research, which you heard uh, Shauna talk about. And within the federal government contracting space, under SAM.gov, SAM.gov is a federal procurement data system, FPDS. And every contract within the government that's over $25,000 has to be reported on that, uh, that website. So you can do research to see what contracts were awarded, what the time frame was, who the awardee was. Um, and that also gives you some ballparks because those solicitations uh, will come open again and again. Um, and you can see how you could stack up. You can see what your pricing is going to be, might, might be potentially. And again, what is the best fit for you in, in the federal government contracting space? The last thing I would say in, in the short period of time that we have is, is to take action. So nothing beats like going to 
um, a site visit. I do construction. I want to go to a site visit. I want to touch things. I want to see it. I want to see under understand what the construction parameters are and uh, any, any impediments. But I also want to network not only with the uh, uh, procurement officials but also my competitors. See, get a, a sense of how hungry they are for this, what they're going to bring to the table, and also uh, maybe how we can partner or um, at least at least understand if if it's a good fit for for myself. So take action by going to site visits. Solicitations have pre-award conferences. Go to the pre-award conferences. Nothing beats like taking action and meeting people and and uh, starting those uh, uh, conversations and dialogues to glean information. Uh, and the last bit would be to attend conferences. You know, we have the um, the Washington presentation coming up with NSBA here in September. Number one, uh, you know, uh, you heard Keith talk about his organization and also an organization on the commercial side. On the federal government side is the National Veteran Small Business Coalition, and they can also help veterans start and grow companies in the federal market space. Excellent. Lots of very good um, information there as well, plus um, the yeah. experience is excellent. Um, so I want to maybe stay still a little bit high level here in the sense that um, maybe in priorities. So I would ask, uh, really, again, let's maybe stick to our order. As Keith, I'll start with you. But the three most important things in acquisition, from your experience. I always appreciated the term, not the lowest prices, but the, you know, the, what these, uh, if I remember right, what they used to call uh, the best uh, offer you know best bid and why i like that was is because it wasn't always price it was quality of work it was your history your reputation uh i during the 14 years that i did federal contracting i am one of the at least as far as i know one of the few uh veteran-owned business who had a true soul uh sole source as well as several set-asides uh, and that was based on the reputation that I had earned, uh, the work that I had done with the VA through the GSA and the other organizations that I had worked with over the years. And I think that that's always the criteria that you want. You know, the, the old cliche, if you will, of, uh, you know, under promise, over deliver. Do the quality of the work that you say you can do and do it on time and deliver the work because that reputation has, at least for me, uh, proven to be the true benefit. Um, I, you know, when you get phone calls out of the blue and somebody is saying, hey, we heard about you, um, that's always a compliment that I never took, you know, for granted. And I think that when you start looking at the acquisition, you're dealing with people. And I think Bill's absolutely right. Um, you know, it wasn't easy for me to get to DC, but it was easy for me to get to Chicago. I mean, Chicago had a huge uh, GSA office there and go and meet the program managers, go and meet the buyers, go and meet the people that you hope to do work with because it is still all things considered a people business. And I, uh, if I was gonna say three things about what's most important three things is do your job, do it right, and get out and, and be meeting people and getting your name and reputation known. Do your job. Good point on the best value contracts as well. Uh, so, Shauna, yeah, exactly. Top three. Yeah, I think the first one would be know that federal procurement processes aren't some mythical or insurmountable beast, right? There is a guidebook for federal procurement. It's the federal acquisition regulation. It's not hidden. It's out there at acquisition.gov. And that is really the principal set of rules that governs all the uniform processes and procedures that most agencies use. There are a few that don't like FAA or the US Mint, but most follow the FAR. And understanding the processes that you need for the type of goods and services that you're selling is key. You know. The FAR is broken down into different parts and subparts, and they all address a different acquisition topic. One talks about um, 
services. One talks about construction. One talks about labor law. One talks about buys that are under $250,000 only. Um, look at it and see what sections of the FAR apply to you and start getting to know uh, the rules and the processes that the government uses. I mean, what's being acquired, what the dollar value is, um, the type of competition procedures, all of that are laid out in there. It, it's no no uh, guessing game, right? It, it's if it's a little bit of a dry read, I'm going to admit, but I, I know it like the back of my hand. I'd say that it's there's a lot of valuable information in there. Uh, if you just even search, you can do a word search now out at acquisition.gov and type in something and it'll pop up all the areas of the regulation where that search comes up. So I think that's real important. Get to know that and understand that there could be different processes uh, that may vary depending on the agency you're working with and the type of contract vehicle you're working with. For example, GSA schedules is different than if an agency just does its own specific contracts. So understanding that there are nuances uh, when it comes to those rules. And then I would think just there's a second one really. It's just know there's resources available to help you. Um, Bill mentioned a lot, but there are a lot of consulting businesses out there that do this work, but there are the SBA procurement center representatives who help small businesses who are trying to win federal contracts. And there are the apex accelerators used to be known as the procurement technical assistance centers or PTACs. Um, but they both are set up to help you determine if you're ready to do federal contracting, help you register in the right places and go through the checklist of, and the order of what to do things in seeing if you're eligible for these certifications that are available and assist you in researching uh, past opportunities and showing you tools to use to do research on upcoming opportunities. So I think that's uh, the biggest things to know about uh, government acquisition. Okay, so Bill, I think I'd, I'd wanna narrow in just a little bit is, um, so we've gotten some real good kind of top threes. I would say basically, in your experience, what's the, the, the art or what's the best way to get the best fit for the customer? So what you have, you know, what your value proposition is, where there's the best fit for the potential customer? How do you find that magic for success and acquisition? So uh, I, I guess it goes back to uh, two things that I mentioned, you know, research um, and, and uh, taking action by going to the, participating in the pre-war conferences, et cetera. Um, but uh, uh, the other thing that uh, Shauna mentioned is um, by uh, uh, pursuing smaller, uh, smaller contracts initially. And the smaller co contracts are uh, number one, as a former contracting officer myself uh, in the Army for a, a little bit, I remember uh, going out and trying to get uh, fine vendors to do buy a product or service that uh, I was uh, assigned to uh, procure. And I got to tell you, many of the solicitations, I couldn't find a, a bidder. Really? Let that sink in. Any of these solicitations don't have a single bidder. So that presents an opportunity. And especially if it's a veteran set aside, um, I would suggest to you that you're going to find some uh, opportunities that won't have a bidder, but certainly will have limited competition. Um, so uh, by starting off small, and you can do that with, uh, you know, finding smaller solicitations, smaller opportunities uh, to build up your experience base, if you will, um, and also understanding if that's truly the organization that's going to be the best fit for you uh, and where you, want, where you see your organization growing uh, to larger and larger uh, uh, contracts. If I may, you know, just comment on what Bill said. I believe my first contract, first federal contract, was right around eight thousand dollars. The last one I had was right around three million. So yeah, you can see what he was talking about. <laughs> I lived, and I absolutely agree with him. Take whatever is reasonable to you, and you can make a profit on it. Uh, I fully accept not only what Bill is saying, it's make yourself available. So I, I would say too, from my own experience um, in trying to introduce a company to a, a new command, if you will, using that credit card under 10,000 capability allowed them to get to know me. And then the next contract was certainly much better. So it's um, the key is kind of what's the old saying, nose under the tent or 
you know, building that relationship. And um, I think you absolutely, all absolutely. So um, let's keep moving. One of the things, um, you know, between the FAR, all the different set asides, the myriad of different types of certifications, um, a certification from a third party versus a government certification or, or stamp, if you will, vis-a-vis -vis any of those categories. Can you all kind of from your slice or perspective speak to the importance of certifications, um, if they are important, if uh, you have some, is it something that you bring out front or do you communicate it verbally, show it on your web page? What are, what's the magic in the certification realm? So Shauna, oh, let's start with you this time. We'll, we'll, we'll okay. spin up a little here. Well, as uh, I'm an SBO, uh, SBA women owned small business myself, so I've lived through this certification process, right? And it's not easy. It takes time and it requires some patience, but I feel there's a lot of importance in it. Um, it's important so that you're making agencies aware that you are a certified, uh, have certified business status when you're responding to requests for information, sources sought, notices, and they know that those types of businesses are interested in opportunities and what you can do. It helps the government inform their acquisition strategy decisions, right? Their acquisition planning. Um, and I think, you know, it depends on the certification as to whether or not a third party certification will hold weight in the federal contracting arena, right? So, um, for example, we have veterans here, you have service disabled veteran owned small business certification, uh, but we may have veterans that are also women owned small businesses, right? So there's also a women owned small business certification that's there and they do allow a third party certification that is approved by SBA. So I think you just have to know the certification program that you're, you're in and you're looking at and what is available and how that weights into the federal. It, it's going to tell you, uh, the, the web pages tell you, SBA's page will tell you. Um, but I will just tell you as a former contracting officer, it's really important to know that those businesses are out there. Um, again, because it, it is what makes the difference as to whether or not, let's say a program that's going to go set aside for a small business instead goes for a service disabled small, veteran owned small business or a woman owned small business or a uh, small disadvantage business, you know, um, there's, it, it makes a big, big difference. And, um, and if you have it, I would say display it prominently on your capabilities statement, put it up front on your website, uh, make sure it's part of the pitch, the sales pitch you do when you're meeting somebody, hey, I'm a SBA certified, blah, 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 business, right? So um, it's important to have that out there. Um, you can't always hang your hat on it, though. It's not the thing that's just always going to be the thing that gets you the contract. You have to have those capabilities uh, along with it. But it is, it is, uh, does show that you are, you know, really interested, invested in um, federal contracting and, um, and invested in your business and moving your business forward. Okay, so Shauna, just real quick, I want to do a quick follow up. So, um, for example, I work in a lot of uh, UASs, unattended robotics or, or drones or different things. Those certifications in that realm are critical. So mm -hmm. it, it's the discriminator or so. So yep. what you talked about was visually, you know, making sure it's on the website, making sure it's in your documentation, verbally in your expression. So What's, is there, you know, how do you distinguish yourself that you have something nobody else has or that this is where you're unique, if you will? Is that something you can use the certification piece for? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the things you can use, um, especially, um, you know, in industries that are a little tighter in terms of competition pools, right? Uh, if you have a, a smaller competition pool, having a certification is, is going to be something that uh, contracting officers are gonna look at and say, okay, well, that we have you know so many certified businesses that are uh, women-owned certified versus uncertified women or veteran certified versus service-disabled veteran-owned small business certified. Um, it does it does have a play. It's not always, I will be honest, a distinguishing factor, um, but it, it's important. It's one piece of that information that's very important because the government uses so many pieces of information 
um, when they're trying to do their acquisition planning that that it could make the difference when all other pieces are the same. First. Quite, I mean, your bound your business foundationally deals in this realm. So, talk to us about certifications. I'm sorry, it was that just to me. Yes, Keith. I'm okay. Sorry. Sorry, I wasn't sure. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's always difficult for me to to isolate this issue because having been involved in the original law. It, that created ultimately created the CBE and that process and being deeply and personally involved with the rules and regulations of what that was supposed to be. The lesson I learned um, is, is what the intent of the law was and what the law actually ended up being is two different things. It ended up where the term verification was a legitimate term in the sense that it was not certification. There is a distinction between being verified or certified. Now, having said that, the transfer, if you will, of the CVE or the VA over to the SBA, they made it absolutely crystal clear that all they're going to do is continue the same process the VA was. In fact, most of you know, if you're involved in it, is, is that the gentleman who was the head of the VA program is now the head of the SBA program of the verification program. On the flip side, the corporate side. The corporations, again, if you look at supplier diversity and what that is, why it was created, what was the purpose of it? You have to go back almost 50 some years to the National Minority Supplier Development Council who wrote really what was considered to be the first set of best practices on certification. What is it that you have to do? What is the documentation? What is the process to be certified? That same process was adapted or adopted by WeBank, by the women, okay? And we uh, being the veterans, really the, the issue that we had to have that we had to address with the corporations is why would veterans be included in supplier diversity in the first place? We actually wrote that rationale. And once that rationale was accepted, we had to create the certification program. So what's happened is the, the question that, that was asked is, is there a difference? Is there a distinction? Absolutely. I mean, it's black and white clear as can be. What they do on the corporate side, what those standards are simply has never been accepted or implemented on the government side. It has to, it still doesn't exist to this day. So what we were able to do is work with the corporations to be able to say, all right, we will do all those things. If you accept veterans and service disabled veterans in the supplier diversity program, we will create a certification that meets your standards. And we did that. And thankfully, uh, matter of fact, General Miller and I were just at a group of, uh, of companies that belong to what is referred to as a billion dollar round table. We have found out that the, their economic impact or report, their newest one will be out shortly, that that represents a market of $126 billion that veterans will have an opportunity to participate in that simply didn't exist 10 years ago. So as we look at this situation, it truly is different. There's different processes, there's different rules in the implementation. So when people come to me and say, hey, wait a minute, we want to get certified because we want to do business with, with the corporations, we tell them, okay, but these are the rules, these are the procedures, these are the documents. They'll say, oh, I'm certified by the VA or the now SBA, and we flat tell them, we don't accept that certification, it does not meet our standards. Well, that's created issues. I'll gladly give you that, but I do want to just say that, yes, there is a distinction and it's very clear if you want to get into those details. Okay, so Bill, tell me 
really what's been the the best art for you in um i mean i know you as have known you for some years you're a very humble man you're kind of quiet in your demeanor in many ways but how do you kind of bring out being a veteran owned company in the right way that's comfortable for you as a ceo um you know but also is a distinguishing factor i mean can you give us some little um you know experiences or ways that you think that's made a difference versus your competitor? Well, um, so I think that, uh, you know, what's, what's a, it, it's always important to focus on your core competency. You know, that has to lead. What is, the, what is your core competency? What's the, uh, your, your value, value proposition that you're going to offer the customer? That has to lead. Uh, now, when you say subtly, I mean, uh, I am a, a veteran-owned small business uh, certified, also SDV OSB certified um, in the federal market space. Um, but uh, in my contact information, I uh, intentionally list that under my my my, uh, my, my name and, and company. So that's a subtle way to do it to let people know that you're you are certified uh, in, in that realm. Um, you know, we we've talked about certainly going to conferences on your business card. Uh, you introduce yourself and your background, your product or service that you're going to offer, but also on the back of your card, you list your NASIS codes and, and your certifications. So it's another way to market, uh, get the word out about uh, about what what, uh, what the status of, of your company. You know, I, I just think that, that there's an enormity of opportunities uh, out there for veterans. There, there, are, there are, it's going to continue to grow. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, it's, 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 uh, there, there's a lot of organizations, a lot of free advice out there because our nation uh, recognizes uh, the, the service that uh, many of us have, have given voluntarily uh, for our, our, our nation to be what it is today. And there, there's opportunities out there for veterans to start and grow their, their own businesses and to seek help. And, and I found that people are more than willing to provide that mo a, a lot on, on a free basis. You know, you can go get a counselor at the Small Business Administration, your, your regional office, number one. You can go to a SCORE office, a senior cadre of retired executives, get free advice on your business plan. Um, I had a board of advisors for free that I would meet uh, every other uh, twice a year to help, help keep me accountable as, as a CEO, the president, who's going to hold me accountable for growing my business. So that helped to keep me accountable uh, with with, with the, that free free advice, if you will. So for veterans, there's lots of opportunities. There's certainly set asides uh, that are mandated by the government. There's a three percent set aside with an entirety of the federal government, um, and, and many organizations surpass that. So the VA typically passes uh, surpasses twenty percent uh, set asides for for veteran um, uh, businesses. Great. Listen, I'm, what I want to do here now is I've got two more quick questions, okay? So I'd asked our panelists kind of quick answers here so we can get to, we've got some wonderful questions and I've asked Ian if he could queue up some. And then um, what I am going to do so we can get as many as possible in is I'm going to kind of assign the question to a panelist. And then if there's an appropriate follow-up, we can do it that way. So we kind of stay nimble on this and we can get, there's some some great things going on in the chat as well. But first, I think, um, Sean, I'd like to start with you and direct a question to you, networking events. We've talked about relationships and um, I've had some young 20 something say, well, the only networking you need to do is online or through social media. I've had others say, you know, the, the old model of going to an event is, is, um, is old. <laughs> I've had others that have won more business by talking to somebody than any other avenue. So a lot of different experiences. Tell me about the value of networking in federal acquisition. Well, to me, as a former contracting officer and chief of contracting, I think networking is key. Um, I think it's really important that you stay in front of the agencies that you're targeting and their personnel in a multitude of ways telephone calls, stop in, meet and greet, say hello, go to their um, corporate uh, agency affairs um, and participate in these, again, requests for information, sources, sought, options, uh, notices, et cetera. And I would say that um, the, the businesses that I know that are small, that have had the most success over the long term 
are the businesses that did that on a routine, regular basis. They came in, met with me, shook my hand, said, hey, I was stopping down the hall to talk with the program manager, thought I'd pop my head in and say hello. How are you doing? Anything out there that we should be aware of? Is there anything we can help you with? I actually had a business get a contract just by simply pivoting when my um, estimator stuck his head in and said, I need some help with estimating. I don't have enough resources to do this. And I had a business in my office who turned around and said, well, that's not what I was here to sell, but I can help you with that. And there we had it, a $3.5 million contract right there, ready to go for this business. And it wasn't the work they wanted to do, but it was the work that the agency needed. And it was, again, a way through that networking, through the relationship building, being in front of people that they found out about that opportunity. Okay, excellent. So now I want to switch to something I know I deal with quite a bit. I hunt disruptive technologies. And so a lot of times the companies I'm dealing with are very sm- that I'm partnering with are very small, very startups, if you will, or new into um, the corporate world. Scalability. So what I'd really like to do is talk, uh, Keith, I'd like to ask yeah. you specifically, okay. as a subcontractor to a corporation, a yeah, larger sure. one, in my yeah. realm, it might be something like Raytheon or VAE yeah. or Lockheed um, or others. And yeah. then, so I'd like you to answer that from a, to, to a subcontractor to corporation. And then Bill, I'd like you to think and answer how you scaled and met those challenges to make sure that your customers as your business continued to be successful and grow, but how they were assured at each stage on the scalability kind of spectrum. Okay, so one Keith? Of, yeah, one of the things that I think gets in the way of some of the veterans and the veteran businesses over the years that I've worked with 20 some years now, or post, over 20 years actually, is their ego. They don't like being a subcontractor or they don't want to be a secondary company. Well, in corporate world where you're dealing with the largest corporations in the world, you're probably never going to even get a chance. You're going to work with what is called a tier one, a tier two, or possibly even a tier three. They're the ones who are going to, especially your tier ones, are going to be the one you're going to be working more directly with or a tier two, because the whole idea here is, is that when you come in, unless you're already as large or you have the money, you have the history, the background, they're never gonna hire you directly. They want to see that you can actually do the job. Take that job as a subcontractor to the tier two, or possibly a tier three, or be that tier three to the tier two and work your way up to scale because they will look at you. They want to know about you. The corporations are very sophisticated in not giving a company, especially a new supplier, more work than one they can handle. Normally that's part of the scale of problem. But more importantly, can you deliver? And what they want to make sure is that one, they don't get hurt, but that you don't hurt the tier two, especially with deliveries and all of the issues of the supplier, uh, uh, supply chain, uh, all those kind of issues that, hey, this job has got to be delivered and you need to do that. So what I've always told the vets is Look up and down. We all been talking about the same thing. We've been using the word federal. This is not that different corporation. See what piece of that pie you can do that you can actually deliver and take it and build your name and reputation like I was talking earlier. I did a lot of work for General Motors for years and years and years under my own personal company for the NBBDC. So the transition for me was a lot easier because I had that name and reputation in that industry. But again, I would say to you, make sure that, and I agree with Bill 100%, do what you love, do it right, and I'll just repeat it, do it on time and on budget. You will grow from there. The companies will help you grow. Okay, so reputation, partnering, and um, delivering. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Bill, tell me about your kind of journey and scalability. Sure. So I uh, mentioned uh, t- taking some small jobs first and with the small jobs, you're going to get that experience. 
Um, you know, I, I can, uh, you know, if you're going to go into construction, which is what we do, and, and as mentioned, uh, larger mechanical electrical plumbing or MEP is, a, is the acronym in the, in the in industry. Um, take a small job um, and, uh, you know, whether it be in, in construction, uh, I'm going to uh, uh, replace a door, okay? So I have a carpenter that comes in and, and uh, or I hire a carpenter or what have you, we replace the door. So we get some experience from that. Next, next project is I have to renovate an office. So there you're talking about hiring painters and maybe some uh, an electrician. Uh, but they, but again, I'm gonna do some research about hiring individuals. Number one, I'm going to attend the site visit. I'm gonna meet uh, other uh, companies that are gonna be there. So not only am I gonna meet competitors at a, at a, a site visit, I'm also gonna meet some potential subcontractors there and I'm gonna be able to vet them. And I know if they're there attending it, I know they're hungry for the work, if you will. Um, the, the other component is I'm gonna do some research about companies that I might need a specialty in. So uh, one, one of the things that I did was to retube a boiler. Um, and so I went out and found the, the, the a nationally recognized boiler company that's not too far from uh, the location of that opportunity and hired them. I managed the project, I hired the laborers, but I relied them th on them for the technical expertise. So the lesson there is you don't have to be um, the expert in everything on a solicitation. And you know what, in the military, we weren't the expert, expert on everything. We had a lot of partners, we fought jointly um, and we relied on combined arms you know, to, to, to prosecute our our, our, our battles. So, and, and there's a sense of that in the, you know, in our uh, industry or in the government contracting as well. Sometimes you can't be, be all and do everything on that solicitation, but you can go out and find partners where you're lacking um, to be, be your partners and, and uh, propose and win on those contracts. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. So now what I want to do is Ian, field me a question and I'll point it to one of our panelists. Okay. These are the questions from the audience. Yes. Now, before we begin, uh, we will obviously recognize that uh, we won't have time to get to every single question. But with that in mind, our team wants to take every single question. So if we don't get to uh, your item here uh, and now, you can reach out to our team and we will look forward to connecting with you further one on one. So thank you in advance for your patience. Um, now, We've received a few questions uh, about uh, being uh, a new business in, in the federal contracting space, having been around for less than two years. Uh, there have been a couple questions about uh, what um, business you're able to, to bid on or what you're able to participate in within your first two years and um, what uh, prior experience looks like and, and what the weight of, of prior experience and uh, in delivery Best performance. Yeah. Past performance. Okay. So um, if we would like to generally address that question, Joni, that would be fantastic. Okay, so I'm going to divide that one up. Um, Shauna, can you quickly answer on the past performance, how important that is? And then um, Keith, can you and maybe talk about uh, new entrants and um, the, the challenges sure. with the yeah. startup, if you will? Shauna? Yeah. Yeah, so I would say, make sure you understand there's a difference between experience and performance, right? Experience first is what you've done in the past and in performance is how well you've done it, okay? So if you don't have past experience, um, what you can, you know, it's, it is a difficult hill to climb, but the way to gain that experience, again, is through these subcontract opportunities, these micro purchases, these things, uh, you can even try to relate commercial uh, experience to what the government's needs are, right? You can talk to those. Um, what I would say is when it comes to past performance, if you don't have a, a record of past performance on a government contract, that the government does take that into account when it is doing its evaluation and will in many cases apply what's called a neutral rating so that contractors without past performance records are not penalized in terms of the evaluation. So um, the instructions on any uh, solicitation package will explain how that occurs. And, um, but I would just say, you know, that's one of the things you can kind of take off the plate is that uh, you won't be penalized for the lack of, of past performance records um, on government work. Okay, can you talk about yeah, I'll, startups? I'll, I'll, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say also <laughs> that uh, when I when I first started the company, uh, for my past performance in, in uh, uh, several cases, I would use my commercial experience. So I was with a, uh, a large uh, pharmaceutical company, a site general manager, I managed construction projects. So I use that as my experience. Um, and and with, of course, with, with the contact information to verify it's a, um, and to do uh, the, the have the contract loss be able to do uh, you know due diligence uh, on, on what I'm what I'm stating as my experience. But that yeah. that is definitely a way to go in, in my view. Uh, whatever you bring to the table, whether it be in your military experience um, or in, in commercially, to bring that into the government space as well. Yeah, if the government allows those past performance questionnaires, that's absolutely what you should do is make sure that your commercial you know, clients have uh, the opportunity to fill that out. They look at all different forms of past performance. It doesn't have to be just what's on the government record, but um, that is one way and, and a more common way now that past performance is, is um, documented. Well, the thing I, I used to do with the, especially new companies, startup companies who have no contracts in that, in that sense, is talk about your employment. What is it that you did? Why did you start this company? If you, you know, if you have a specialized skill or knowledge, and that was what prompted you to start the business, then put that on in writing and put that on paper, much like Bill was saying, and, you know, I use them as references. Hey, my ex-employer was, I developed this skill while working for them and I took it into my personal business. You know, if you have no, you know, contracting experience, you start in the door, use what you have from employment. And that's always seemed to be the starting point that at least they would consider you. I might add in there, um, especially yeah. when you're writing proposals in that sp space that is asking for past performance or experience, um, it's good to have a colleague that knows you or a friend that knows you just to review at least that section, because they might know something you've done in your past that you're, you're leaving out or so. And I have found that in my history to be very, very helpful. So they might say, hey, what about this? You'd worked on this or we did this together. Would this be relevant? So sometimes it's very easy to forget some of the, the, the gems in your crown and um, a, a good colleague or a red team member that knows you or maybe even your spouse when you're starting out. It um, can be very, very helpful to um, have uh, some others take a look at that part of a proposal or highlight areas you should bring out. Okay, so what, what, I'd, what I'd like to do is just make a recommendation what you don't do. If you've been fired, you hate your boss, your boss hates you, do not put them down as a reference. <laughs> and, uh, Only the ones that liked you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> Believe it or not, I had that happen. Good point. Wow. Well, <laughs> you know, I'm point. just saying. Yeah. <laughs> and next question right. or next area. To continue on this line of, of thought here, especially for um, businesses without a strong past performance or an extensive past performance track record, uh, what weight is put on uh, a company's capability statement? Okay, so guys, I'm gonna give you a challenge, 30 seconds each on capability statements. I'll do it in okay. five. Okay. I'll do it in five seconds, a lot. Okay. Capability Shana? statement is critical. Okay. I, th I, think, I think having a capability statement is, it's your written elevator pitch, right? It's just as important as having that succinct uh, pitch that you, you say when you meet people in person. So it's important. Capability statement for your company is like a resume when you're looking for a job. So, yeah. it, it, again, I'll make another recommendation. Please spell check everything that you do. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> Good point. Okay, Ian, next. Um, this question has partially been addressed, but um, just so we can put a bow on it, uh, if folks are looking for new, or if they're new to the space looking for subcontract opportunities, uh, if they're looking for two for tier two and tier three opportunities, uh, where would you all recommend starting the search? Okay, so that's um. Let's unpack that question. 
I'm going to let each one of you take a piece of that question. Okay. And Bill, I'm going to start with you this time. Mix it up a little bit. Well, we, we talked about research. So if you're uh, going in, um, you got to you got to look for an agency that has what you, what you have to offer. So that, that takes some research. Uh, and then again, it takes uh, taking action, going to the conferences and, and develop, starting to develop some relationships. Make sure you're, you're a good fit for that or, uh, organization. I absolutely agree. You, the research is critical. I mean, you know, depending on what industry you're in, you know, you talk about construction. Well, what part of construction uh, is that? Are you an electrician? Are you HVAC? What are you sling drywall? What do you do in construction? Uh, so yeah, it, it, that's absolutely critical because every major corporation has their tier one, tier two, the, their main suppliers. Do the research and find them. So where do you find these? Shauna, maybe can you touch on that a little bit? Where do you find those subcontracting opportunities? Yeah. Knew? Well, first of all, matchmaking events, right? Anytime there's a matchmaking event with corporations or an agency, attend, right? You'll meet people, you'll meet the agency. It's a good way to do it. Um, SBA has a tool called Subnet that you can just Google Subnet. And uh, it's a uh, database of subcontract opportunities where large businesses are out there looking for subcontractors in specific socioeconomic categories, such as veteran-owned, service-disabled, veteran-owned, women-owned, et cetera, businesses. And then lastly, I would say, going back to GSA, since GSA has such a large group of businesses on schedule, that the GSA e-library is a good place to look. You can go out there and search on the types of goods and services that you provide. You can export a list of all schedule holders and it includes their contact information. It includes uh, a statement of work as to what they provide. And you can see uh, and start to build relationships there as a subcontractor to a larger supplier to the government. So, Ian, I'm going to do a little point of privilege here as moderator. I'm going to inject a question that I have, if you will, and then be ready to tee up the next one if you could. So I'm curious in the sense of one of my greatest frustrations coming out of industry and actually getting kind of recruited into what I do, if you will, is the length of time it takes the government to make a decision rich, large versus business to business. Um, so if, if you guys could, uh, the three of you quickly just speak to that. Is it, um, and I see a lot in our chat about the length of time to get to this certification, the length of time to get a response. What are those factors? What's behind that? Um, are there ways to accelerate things once you've submitted? Could you speak to that time framework in the government? I know, Shauna, you know this better probably than any of us, but one of the things that I look at is what are they really doing here? Is this an RFP, RFQ? What is it? What is their time? Because again, looking at it, they normally will give you a decision time or an expected time for a decision to be made. And you know, if you're gonna be in that game, you gotta learn exactly what you're looking at and what it implies you know because again a lot of these times they do get dragged out and they have they it, and Sean again I, I just defer to you because again something that was supposed to be done in January they may not tell you what year so you know, it could be three years down the road and and I, I, I think everybody doing federal contact has had a similar story but um, you know, I just always tried to make sure if it was available that I knew when a decision was exposed to be delivered and I would bid accordingly. Well, I would answer from your perspective, and Sean, I want you to wrap this up with a big crescendo. Okay. Time frames, Bill. Sure. So, um, you know, in the uh, construction industry, you have uh, site visits at the site after the site visit. Um, you've, you've read the solicitation, you've looked at the drawings, um, you've attended the site visit, you have an opportunity, and, and, and in fact, it's an expected that you'll submit some RFI, some requests for information, which is part of the Q&A. And part of your Q&A can be, and if you're un uncertain, can be, is this fully funded, number one. Number two, what is the time frame expected for award? 
And so by doing that, you put them on the spot, you have make them have, have a commitment because these things are a two-way relationship. So you're dependent on them for to give you answers so you can plan accordingly your, your work crew, your, your structure, your timing, so you can have the best product. They owe you an answer for that. And you can do it in a tactful manner, but also persistence. I would say pleasant persistence pays. You keep, you know, and, and, and keep on at, you know, talking, keep on uh, uh, going with the dialogue till you get a good answer. Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. So I'm a big crescendo here <laughs> from, well, from the other been, side. <laughs> having been the person that's been responsible for making a lot of these decisions, I will yeah. tell you that acquisition planning starts early, right? So when you first hear about a requirement, it could be six months to a year before the government ever intends to put that requirement out for bid. So just know that and be prepared. Second of all, once it is ready to go for solicitation, the federal acquisition regula regulation does outline rules and guidance about how long things must be publicized, okay? So things must be publicized for a certain period. There must be a certain time between the announcement of a project and the release of the solicitation, things like that. And then when the government is in the business of robust negotiations, it could take a while. There could be a reason why it is taking a while to get to that decision, that award decision on a contract, right? If, if uh, multiple parties are interested, if a protest comes in prior to award, that can definite de definitely delay some of these um, timelines. So I would just say, again, like Bill said, you know, ask the question. The government expects you to ask the question. If you haven't heard anything, if you're not sure, you haven't seen anything come out, it doesn't hurt to ask the question. Um, it, we get them all day long, every day. Our mailboxes are full of them and uh, yours will be no different than anybody else's and nobody will hold it against you. I promise you. Sure. So when, when, I, when I submit a uh, proposal, um, uh, every uh, 10 days or, or so, I go back, if I haven't heard of a contract award, Every 10 days, I'll, I'll uh, uh, send a question uh, or a, 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 an email to the contracting officer uh, and courtesy copy of the, the program manager or, um, you know, do you have all the information you need to make a decision? And uh, uh, your energy stands by to immediately perform on the contract. It should be we award the contract. Now I know as a former contracting officer, they have all the information they need. They have, they would have to go out uh, to uh, to everybody to ask for information, but it keeps me in the game. Number one, it lets them know that I'm hungry, that I'm available, that I'm, I'm motivated to perform in that contract. Number two, and number three, it's like like anything else in life. The more you talk to people, the more uh, you're. It's actually a form of marketing that, that that they're seeing seeing your name again, and and you're you're continuing to develop that relationship. Well, and I would just say to piggyback on what Bill said, you know, even if you don't win this award it keeps you in the mind of the contracting officer for the next opportunity, right? So really important. So lose graciously and keep the relationship. I think that's Absolutely. another little important thing to, to, to mention. I'm, I'm sure it's intuitive, but that's important. Um, so I'm, Ian, I'm going to let- two words, thank you, to be really important. Absolutely. Good point, Keith. Excellent. Oh. Ian, we're going to do one more question with um, the responses from our each one of our panelists. So I want the absolute biggest, bestest question out of all the comments. So not to put pressure on you. Thank you, Joni. The, the question that I'm seeing in the chat here and also privately uh, is about what to do when you feel hopeless. Uh, perhaps the certification process is taking longer than expected. Uh, perhaps um, uh, receiving compensation or payment for a contract is is taking longer than expected, uh, or or things really just aren't aren't going your way. You're having trouble finding footing. Um, we, we'd love to know from our panelists uh, what to do when when you're feeling discouraged or things aren't working out. Uh, and then Joni, I have I have one final plug to make on that note as well. Absolutely. So I'm going to start, and I'm going to do this in the order of Bill. Keith and Shauna on the hopeless feeling. And I'm gonna start by answering that myself as well. First of all, reach out and talk to someone. 
reach out to another veteran, reach out. That's why NSBA created the Veterans Network. Become part of that network. It's to be able to talk to those that have been down that same path, have maybe not had your ex specific experience, but can lend you some support because it's easy in any kind of endeavor in life to get discouraged. And if you can you know, basically reach out even to someone you don't know, but has had some experience. I think that's the reinforcement because, you know, it could just be a moment away and your attitude and being able to stay positive makes a world of difference. So that's my overarching comment. And I know that's been a lifesaver for me when I get frustrated or feel like this is a dead end. And then, you know, there's been a, a great opportunity next. If I've had a chance to talk to someone, hear their experience, get some guidance. So Bill, talk about that from your sure. perspective. Well, well so, so two thoughts on that. One is um, hopefully your business is not reliant on just one specific contract. Um, hopefully you've got some diversification um, and so if something doesn't work out right for, and it's not your fault for whatever reason that you have other avenues, you can continue your revenue. So that's, that's one a strategy, if you will, to help mitigate that. Um, having said that, I've certainly been, uh, been involved with some contracts where for whatever reason, um, couldn't get it scheduled. Um, and, and literally it took me uh, 18 months to come to a, a resolution, not being able to, uh, schedule um, in the implementation of a contract, which which uh, the, the government awarded me. Um, but uh, but you know we go back to uh, pleasant persistence pays. You know what can we do together collectively to 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 make this happen? Um, and sometimes it's just not going to work out, and you know you're you're going to get a, t a termination for convenience, and you'll put your claim in, and you'll you'll move on. But uh, you know I go back to that pleasant persistence pays. You know never quit. And seek advice. You talked about uh, networking with your peers. You, you, you have an enormity of help out there within the government. You have your regional advisors with the Small Business Administration. Uh, you have the, the various different uh, veterans uh, organizations to, to seek assistance from. So seek and get help. And, and know that you're not alone. <laughs> That's all I got to say. We've, we've all been there. We've all needed some help. You're not alone. And, and many veterans are, are willing to. to to, to uh, uh, pay it forward. Absolutely. Keith, talk well, to that because your sure. network is wonderful and a great reinforcement when you feel that hopelessness, if you will. It is. And to me, a couple of shots of tequila always helped. You know, you got to, <laughs> you know, I mean, look, you got to be able to step back and take a look at where you are, how you got to where you are, and what really it is you, the situation is. You know, I, a lot of times you wake up feeling helpless, but if you look around, look at your finances, look at where you are in, in this process. You know, there was an old adage that you should have at least six months of cash or six months of money set aside to pay your house payment, to do all of those kinds of things. Too many people gamble, don't have that set up before you jump in. Well, you may have to back up. You know, I tell the story, I've had three companies. I started my first one in 84. That company was what I call too successful, too soon. It almost cost me my marriage, my children, my personal element. So I chose to set it down. The second one was exactly the opposite of the first one. I lost virtually all the money I made in the first one, <laughs> woke up broke, and about $30,000 in debt. Now, my third one has been running some 25 years and I've learned how to pretty much, you know, keep that level. But I think those kind of, uh, of stories are the same kind of stories that help each other. You know, and, and, and I do believe in what Bill and, and everybody else is saying and, and what you're saying, network, reach out. There's nothing wrong, you know, in the sense of saying, hey, I need help. Especially, you know, most of the veterans that I know, or if you are, in fact, you know, a veteran, uh, depending on what you did in the military, chances are you could always use another veteran to help. So, you know, don't be afraid to reach out. Excellent. Shauna, thoughts? 
Yeah, same echoing everyone's. I think just find a trusted group that you can, um, you know, throw these issues and ideas out with that can give you feedback and share experiences with. That's uh, really important to share your experiences positive and negatively when you're coming into the government environment. Your expectations um, will change. I will say, you know, your expectations will change. Be prepared for that. Okay. And the other thing I would say is find and build a relationship with a trusted government mentor. Um, there are small business specialists, there are SBA personnel, there are contracting officers and contract specialists and program people who want to see your business successful, and they will help coach you through the process, not give you an advantage that over your competitors that you shouldn't have, but they will help mentor you through the process and guide you through. I've done that with several small businesses myself uh, because I take an interest in this. This is, this is what I've decided to retire and do for a living. So I enjoy it. Um, but that, that's really important. And make sure that you, you check in once in a while and, and check in on those expectations. Um, but know that they'll change and shift and ebb and flow as the government has needs, your business grows. Um, and changes and shifts. So just uh, be prepared. It is kind of the ship where you're going back and forth on the waters, right? And, and uh, having that expectation going in is really important. I'd, I'd like to just make one comment that from what Sean was saying, we have the same situation in the corporate world. There are a lot of very dedicated uh, people in supplier diversity who will help you, help guide you, help direct you, reach out and talk to them. These people have been doing, like I said, certification. They've been doing you know, supplier diversity for over 50 years. They know how to help people and they're willing to do it. They're willing to help us with that. So I think to remember always that people talk about their successes. They don't mention their challenges a lot of times, but many times if you reach out and say, hey, I'm in this situation, do you have any guidance for me? Something like that. They'll easily open up and tell you, well, I had this thing happen first and then this, or, or it's kind of as Keith went through his scenario or so. And you will find that you have a lot of camaraderie in some of the frustration and some of the challenge. And then um, I think the next day it starts to get better. So uh, the key is to, to keep the conversation going. And with that, I'd like to turn it over now to Ian to tell you about how at NSBA, we keep a conversation going, an active, a go-get-it conversation, a proactive conversation, as Bill says, and then Patrick's going to wrap us up here today. So with that, um, Ian, Thank you so here. much, Joni, and, and really thank you to all of our panelists and, and all of our attendees today. Now, I think that uh, this, this final question uh, was a fantastic question because again, it can be fine. It can be difficult to find folks to to lean on or uh, to commiserate with, but uh, that's that's one of the needs that we want to uh, fill here at, at NSBA. Uh, so within our veterans network, uh, we have uh, one mission uh, that that is being broken down at the tactical level and then the strategic level. At the tactical level, we're here to network, we're here to interact, we're here to share insights. Uh, and with that in mind, we are actually launching a new program, uh, which we will call our Veterans Network Mentorship Program. Now I've just shared a link in the chat uh, to our webpage where you can find more information on this, on this complimentary uh, program in which you'll be matched either with a mentor or a mentee, depending on your needs. And again, at the tactical level, we can discuss our pain points, uh, we can uh, come up with hacks and solutions for whatever challenges you may be facing, and we'll be continuing this conversation there. Now, at the strategic level, we ultimately want to come up with solutions. So the other element of this Veterans Network will be to advocate on Capitol Hill uh, and within the halls of other uh, federal branches from the White House to the Department of Defense to the Small Business Administration, uh, and ultimately structurally or come up with structural solutions to these challenges. So again, we'd be grateful to have you all there. I've shared a link in the chat and uh, we look forward to, to welcoming you into our veterans network and into our mentorship program. Uh, yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks Ian, thanks Joni. Um, Joni did a great job doing a, a promotion of, of NSBA and who we are and what we do at the beginning of this call. 
And I can just tell you that you know, we have a lot of people on this call are members of NSBA and are veterans and are part of our leadership council. Uh, veterans make great members as, as advocates. They, uh, when we need them to pick up the phone and call their congressman, they're doing it. If we need them to do a survey, they're doing it. If they're coming, if, if we need them at a meeting, they're there. So we just really appreciate uh, our veterans as being part of the uh, NSBA. Um, if you're on this call and you aren't a member, um, we, you know, we, we'd love you to join. You can go to nsba.biz uh, and, and join online. Uh, we do also have a leadership council. If you're interested in that, you can contact me directly at uh, ppost at nsba.biz to discuss getting on, the, on that council. Uh, we also have a technology council that deals mainly with SBIR, STTR contract grants. So if that's of interest to you, um, you, know, you can join us and, and be part of that also. Um, but what we do is we're an advocacy group. So if you feel that you, know, you need a voice in Washington, we, we'd love to have you as a member and, and would encourage you, you to join. And again, thanks, thanks to all who got on this call today and I will turn it back to Joni. So I would just like to say, first of all, it's not only are we an advocacy group, we are a nonpartisan advocacy group. So our party is small business, our business is small business, and our job is to represent you all. And um, I'm just very proud of the work we've done to help support our veteran-owned businesses. So you are really the, the, the foundational part of our economic security. And in our global ecosystem these days, that's absolutely critical. I'd like to say to every one of you that are a veteran or a spouse of a veteran or veteran family, thank you very, very much for your service. Because of you, we have an ability to be free, open, and wonderful small businesses. And um, that is a debt that we I feel, and I literally hit my knees at night and thank all of you for your service, your continued service to the nation by being a great small business. So thank you. This has been a great conversation. I only apologize in that we didn't get maybe to everybody's question, but there's a lot of good information over here in the chat. So copy anything. Ian can you know, put some other things out. You should have our contact information. And from there, we hope we can continue and to, to serve and to help you all in your journey. Good luck, good success, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you. Great, great. thank you. Thank you.